everybody. Thank you for coming to this workshop. Um, we're all going to say a few words up at the front and then hopefully turn it over to yourselves. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm assuming that by sustainability, um, what we mean really is money. Um, <laughs> there are other things which you need to be sustainable, but, but realistically, you know, you can take care of, of your own needs in terms of emotional and spiritual well-being, but actually this is about how do you keep doing what you're doing and, and not have to go and do something else, which is more uh, better at paying bills and what bank managers will accept as collateral. Um, my name is Dave Boyle. I do a bit of work with the Media Reform Coalition. Uh, you heard our chair, Des Friedman, speak this morning. Um, my other hat that I wear is supporting um, cooperative businesses and community groups uh, get organised and raise finance. Um, and I did a report for Cooperatives UK on how um, cooperatives were potentially a way to resolve a problem in, in how do you fund media. Um, in a nutshell, um, it struck me that um, two things which the media have a constant deficit of accountability and also a massive need for, which is money, could be the solution to both of these problems could be the same thing. Um, and it's, it's struck me that most of the media has historically been based on funding by one of two means. One of them is through the cover price, so you pay for the, the product you are consuming, and the other is where you get someone to give you money to access your readership called advertising. Um, and essentially, it's indirect. They don't really give us stuff what you're writing as long as punters want to read it. That's good enough for them. And it struck me that as the entire media world started to get very panicky as the advertising model collapsed, and uh, um, it turned out that Google was far better at targeting advertisements at the people we wanted to get than, than this happenstance of maybe they just happened to be reading this piece of paper which I gave some money to last week. Um, there was another way to look at media as a service rather than as a product. Um, before I did any of this, I used to work with football fans, um, helping them turn their football clubs into cooperatives. Um, you might have noticed from looking at the news, we weren't as successful as I would have liked to have hoped, uh, but FC United are due to open their ground at Broadway Park very soon. Um, but radical media, independent media, feels quite like a football team, because people support it. It's about your identity. You don't consume it because you think the writing's beautiful or the print's really quite sexy. It's because it's telling a story about the world which you think needs to be told. And the people who read what you read do so partly to find out about those issues, but also because they want to live in a world where these issues are being written about and spoken about. So there's a community of interest who, who, who at the moment, all we, in order to give money to an organisation who are, who are writing about these issues and communicating on them, you have to get them to enter a transactional relationship with you. I don't know about you, but if you've ever done crowdfunding, when you get rewards, you know, if you give this much, you get a T-shirt. I think that's completely the wrong register, because I'm ready to give you 20 quid, but then you tell me I'm going to get a T-shirt, which I know costs you £1.50, and I'm starting to think you're stiffing me for £18.50 on the deal. Whereas if you'd have said, if you don't give us this money, we won't be able to do the lovely things we want to do in the world, you have me at 20 but you've, you've made me think transactionally. I'm a tight ass git, I don't buy The Guardian because I don't read enough of it to make it worthwhile, so I'll just cherry pick the articles. But I want to live in a world where Nick Davis gets the chance to write stories about dead girls' phones being hacked. And, but I, at the moment, the only way The Guardian can get money off me is to either go to their stupid, ridiculous coffee shop and become a member, or, or alternatively to buy the bloody paper or get a subscription. And again, I don't want to do any of those things. I just want to show my support in some financial way. So I've been working with a few organisations who've been thinking maybe this is a way we could look at sustaining our productions. Um, and it, there's a long history of essentially crowdfunding alternative media. And it's very big in the US with listener-supported radio. Those of you who listen to those stations or podcasts every six weeks, it's not the show you're listening to, it's basically a telethon style appeal. Everything stops, everybody raises money, and then they carry on producing the media for the next X number of months until they run out of cash again. It works, but there is an element of Groundhog Day about it, and it always feels to me that every successive iteration is slightly less successful, and you need to do slightly more work to get the same amount of money as you got last time. And ultimately, it leads to burnout um, amongst people who are very prone to burnout anyway, because if you care about these kind of issues, you tend to be the kind of person who can't stop immediately. Uh, there's always somebody who needs some help from something like what you're doing in your community. So getting it onto a sustainable way forward where these kind of issues aren't dependent on you not being ill 
um, doesn't seem to be a particularly good way forward if we're going to try and build the media we're looking for. So just to give you a couple of examples of, of what I found when I was researching these issues and some of the groups we've worked with, um, <coughs> there's a, a very long tradition of, of essentially custom around media. Um, there's a really interesting example in Germany, Tageszeitung, which was funded by the West Berlin government as an example of what a free society press looks like. When the war fell, the West Berlin government went, we don't need this shit anymore. And but a lot of people in West Berlin went, well, actually, we do. We do want somebody to hold a mirror up to the government and, and hold power to account. So Tanger's item did something quite interesting. They're, they're a workers' cooperative in terms of how the, the media is produced, so they democratically elect the editor, I know. And the sky doesn't turn black with Russian paratroopers the next day. Are you listening, Mr. Rushbridger? Um, the, but the actual owners of Tagus Item are the readers who invested 1 million euros to give it a capital base on which it can afford to lose money year on year, but it still has a fighting fund to enable it to make strategic changes, to pursue new opportunities, to develop as an organisation. Um, there's another newspaper in Switzerland whose name I forget, but it also has Zeitung in it, funnily enough. Um, and uh, they, they have a very similar model. Um, there's a long hit go even further back. There is a very strong history of community and cooperatively owned media. Most of the Canadian media west of the uh, of Manitoba used to be run by cooperative uh, enterprises in, the, in essentially the farmer communities who recognised that they had to help themselves because nobody else would help them. Um, there's a lovely little paper called the Intercounty Leader in Wisconsin, which is actually owned by its advertisers. <coughs> quite dodgy, you might say, but what it does mean is that the people whose money is actually dependent, who need that paper to exist, have a stake in it, so the profits get repatriated back to the people who've generated them in the first place. Um, the big one I'm working with at the moment is Positive News, which is a publication probably many of you are aware of. Positive News, like a lot of organisations, was sustained with love and donations, and all of a sudden the donations dried up, and it turned out because their main donor died and they didn't realise that they were left with a massive hole um, which was going to force the paper to close. So they did an interim crowdfunding appeal and were absolutely blown away that with no marketing behind it at all other than a, essentially a begging letter, they raised 30,000 quid from their readers, but that basically gets them another two to three issues and it's not sustainable. So we're working with them on a uh, what's called a community share issue where you sell equity. Um, and what I really like about this is that it, it, it essentially... The problem with a lot of marketing hooks for any type of media is that there's a, a marginal cost. So you get a free CD on the front of them, I'm sure my age, nobody gets free CDs anymore. <laughs> but, but believe me, kids, they did. It was all the time. Um, but that in itself costs. So yes, you might get some more sales, but those sales have cost you because you've had to buy the CDs, package them, insert them into the paper. So there's a declining margin. But if you sell power, that doesn't cost you anything. <coughs> if you sell the ownership of of the thing you're working on to the people who care about it. It doesn't actually cost you to sell 10,000 of them or 100,000 of them because you're selling essentially a, a, an infinitely divisible um, resource, which is power and sense of ownership. And ownership matters. Uh, people increasingly recognize ownership matters. Um, we heard it in the opening plenary about, you know, it's, I like it because basically, um, We've got an entire marketing industry that tells people that they need to own a pile of crap they don't need to own. And they often do this not on the basis of how great this pile of crap is, but doesn't ownership feel nice? They've done the heavy lifting for us to make people realise that ownership is quite nice. It gives you a sense of power, it gives you a sense of engagement and ownership. Community shares are really good uh, at this because they're basically equity investments for, for the rest of us. It's not high rollers who are investing tens of thousands on the basis of a return. It's ordinary people putting in 100 quid, 200 quid. What's really nice about them as a method is that most crowdfunding and any donation appeal, people tend to spend beer and coffee money on that. So they think, if I give you 25 quid, that's one less takeaway. That's not going out for a night out with my mates like I would have done. I'll, I'll reintegrate that spending into the money we've got. What happens with... with um, cooperative or community share investments is that people dip into their savings and that's not me I don't have any savings they're all gone but there are a lot of people who do have savings there is 1.2 trillion pounds worth of savings in the UK and that's not pensions that's just earning 0.25% in the bank account which people have been set up by their banks 
Um, another stat which I'm going to use, it, I'm not sure I can properly integrate it. There are 8,000 <coughs> people in England who listed in the last census um, that Welsh was their main language. Have you ever met anybody in England speaking <coughs> Welsh as their day-to-day -day language? I've never, but there are 9,000 of them. So all they have, you know, so that, how, many, how much money do those 9,000 people have? It doesn't take much to dip into a small resource to get quite a lot of money under those terms. And <coughs> the other beauty of it is that you can get a tax break. <laughs> tax breaks for the right people. Um, and you can, you can get that set against the investment which they might make in your publications. Um, so Positive News will be launching that community share issue in about two months' time. We're looking to raise, we're being ambitious, we're trying to raise a quarter of a million quid. What that's going to enable is a transition to a digital uh, production and to develop sort of consultancy and training around the positive news scene, um, which might raise extra revenue in a way that just trying to sell ad space or sell publications to people might, might not get. That's following on the heels, the first people to do that were Ethical Consumer Magazine, uh, who used to be a workers' cooperative, realised they needed to spend quite a lot of money to get a decent web presence, and they didn't have any. So they raised £200,000 from their readers and said, if we don't get this money, we don't exist. And if we don't exist, nobody's going to do the kind of stuff about checking which is greenwash and which is actually genuinely ethical products, which, which walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, and they said to their community, they threw themselves upon the mercy of their community of interest and said, if not you, then no one. The only people who will do this are other people who we just know we can't trust what they'll actually report because of the source of the money. So if, you know, as, as James Murdoch, that paragon of independent radical media said, the only way to guarantee a free press is through profit. Um, he was almost on the right lines. The only way to guarantee independence is making sure you're not beholden to any of the bastards. And the people who aren't the bastards are your readers who want to live in a world where you write the stories you write and connect the community campaigns up with each other to try and make a change. So I'm going to hand over to Drew, whose colleagues heard me talk this tendentious crap a few years ago. And went, that sounds like a neat idea. Maybe we should try it. Um, so how <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just spoke in the last meeting about the Bristol Cable, so I'm just going to briefly say <coughs> that the following day's advice, um, we undertook uh, to produce a local publication, we print 10,000 copies every two months. Um, we're organised as a cooperative, we're going to have our first AGM next week in which the membership get a say, a say in the general direction of the publication um, <coughs> and the work that they want us to see us do. Um, we've got 150 members now. We've been going in print. We've been in print for three months. So it's looking pretty good. I mean, everyone pays a pound a month upwards. Most people obviously pay a pound a month. You have a handful of people paying ten pound a month. Um, and yeah, so in terms of, I mean, in terms of finances, we also put advertising, strictly controlled advertising in the last edition. But between those things, we are covering our cost of print. The challenge now is to how to expand and to cover the costs of uh, rent and paying everybody who contributes. Um, yeah, that's. Hmm. Uh, hello, my name is Amanda and I work at a new internationalist. Um, so I work on sales and marketing, so normally people want to talk to the editors and not me. But um, I think more about the sales. So we are a non hierarchical equal pay cooperative. We've had a structure for quite a long time, quite well established. Um, it basically, we do all our decisions about consensus making. And we uh, sell our uh, magazines through subscriptions. We always had, back in the day, they right people preceding me, followed the early ideas of getting people onto direct debit and getting that commitment. And, uh, and also, I think what was good about the international is that everyone, even though it's a very politically motivated organisation, everyone really recognised the importance of the finances. And we saw kind of like the levellers go because, you know, it's, we got, I was amazed when I joined the huge amount of organisation in meetings, groups, minutes, accounts, um, and everyone's really on that. So I think that is one thing that stood us in good stead. 
But, you know, we're in this print industry, and um, one thing I do, it's, I love this job working with um, independent media and also sort of like-minded NGOs. It's a really good collaborative place. Keep a very good eye on what's going on in the corporate print world to get ideas. We often have enormous budgets to do testing that I could only dream of doing. Um, so I was like look at least listening to what's going on in that world. Um, print is dropping like 9% year on year. Using current affairs this year dropped 6.5%. No one's, you know, um, not many people are having the lifestyle that print used to have. Um, but there's a lot of excitement about digital. Um, but I have to always temper my editors because magazines that are doing well in digital generally are getting about 10-15% of their revenue from digital. You know, I went to this um, expo recently and the talk <coughs> now is like, are apps all they're cracked up to be? And <laughs> like, so there's a bit of a reality check going on and of course all those things are phenomenally expensive. So the route we're taking with New Internationalist is uh, basic diversification, model of what's good to learn from digital is that you try things quickly, they don't work, you leave, and you try something else. Um, and so what we have done, we've, for a while we've published books, and we've got an ethical mail order, so we've got these different elements of the business. We're non-profit, I should say, it sounds like we've got a great business, we don't, <laughs> like, we really are, it's a, it's a passion for the people in the organisation. But um, yeah, everything we do has this ethical strand. Um, so in terms of the magazine, the approach has really been as the people diversifying how they read, how they consume media. You need to be everywhere for everyone. Or, you know, on all the devices. We're just really launching our website, and we're creating different packages so people who consume media one way can get it this way. Print still the hub of most publications. That's still got to, you know, still so important to us. Uh, also, looking at who our readers are and what they're doing, and a huge amount of the teachers, which we sort of known and liked that, but now we're doing brilliant things with them. We're, you know, we find out they like certain elements of our magazines, and we're pulling that out and making PDFs that they can print off the classrooms. We're doing in institutional subscriptions, which you know, getting that out. We're finding that. Um, Funny, I quite like the idea. Um, independent sixth form schools have loads of money and they're buying lots of new internationalist subscriptions. So we're getting our magazine out to these private schools as well as you know the universities that are appropriate. Um, so that's one thing we're looking at. We're looking at um, so the academics quite people doing workshops as well, quite a lot. Uh, we're also looking at funding. What you're talking about is that you know we have been selling it as a product, but there's this enormous support for who we are because people read us because of the information and that they gain, but they also share our politics we find and they just, it's extra, it's something you don't find in you know, the week magazine or something. And uh, we just got these lovely letters. So we started tentatively looking at what they do in North America, that it's very much, independent media is very much seen as something that should be supported and subsidised by the government in Canada. So we started sending out asks to our readers saying, you know, could you support us a bit more? We are independent, we have to cover our costs, we won't take advertising, we don't want to be influenced, we need to keep our independence. So that has to come from them. And we've had a great response. And we we don't get people to direct debits, we've followed um, we followed the model of NGOs and to try and get them onto this continuous payment. We find people paying five, ten, fifteen, twenty pounds. A month, it's phenomenal. So we're now developing that. We're looking at um, you know how we can encourage that, how we can shape up you know the way we do things to tap into that and to enjoy that more, and maybe looking also at grants and um, you know is there an opportunity for us to get some grant funding. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're trying. Basically, there's one thing there is no golden bullet. And people love to hear the next big thing and jump on that. And you know, um, but you know, I think for me, my theory is you have to try anything and do everything you can and see what works. <coughs> um, but I would reiterate what I said earlier that what is unique and special about what we do is that there's that extra support for who we are. It's not just a product that people buy. It's it's, a, it's great. Yeah. And I come here because I wanted to learn more about community share because I'm really interested in doing that. <laughs>
and a, a pot leaf. Yeah. And a final speaker is Charlotte McCann from Transition Paper. Hi, um, I've been editing this paper for the last three years. Um, it's a national, which is a big, big challenge. I uh, didn't mention distribution, nobody's mentioned distribution. Um, if you, can, you can make a paper like this, and it, and it can look snazzy, and it's all kind of, um, it's, it's uh, totally recycled, non-toxic, totally ideologically sound paper in many ways, but um, uh, paying for it and getting it distributed is, 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 is a problem. And also, um, we wanted to right from the start, um, being ex-journalists, all the people that worked on this are ex-journalists and professionals. Um, even though we're part of the transition movement, it's completely based on the transition movement and affiliated uh, progressive movements. We all wanted to pay, pay ourselves. And you can produce a newspaper, but if you have to pay the people producing it, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> um, particularly sort of people like me who've worked for, you know, a really long time on for nothing. And then you start getting really, really annoyed and you just really want to get paid for your for very hard work. And so um, I just want to say very, very quickly, because I think it's spoken very eloquently about how they fund it. We ran as a cooperative. Um, we made uh, collective decisions about everything. We were all paid the same, which is extremely little. <laughs> I think I earned £1.50 an hour producing this, uh, and it took 300 hours of my, of my time. Um, we uh, initially got uh, three funds. We, we got money from the uh, network of social change. We got money from the transition network, but they were both very small grants. They were uh, they were five hundred five thousand pounds each, um, which is not very much money to run a newspaper. I can tell you. Um, how we distributed it was we would sell bundles of like out of fifty or one hundred twenty-five to different transition groups and community groups around the country. We, we sold here in Manchester as the community index. Um, and, and those people would go out and distribute and sell it, because our idea was that we, we, we produced about 10,000 of these, um, and, some, and, and a couple of issues of that went up to 18,000. Um, we sold them for one pound. So that meant on, on the sales, because it, it cost us about 30 pence to produce, so the people selling were actually making a profit. So there was an inducement to do that. But unfortunately, the thing we felt up against was even though people loved it, um, even though people, people did find it very, very difficult to sell, they didn't like to be in that cop, they did not like to have that transaction. <coughs> Basically, people don't like paying writers. <laughs> they don't like paying editors. They like, they just like getting their stuff for free. And of course, being the news then, everybody's used to it. You know? So that's where we, we piss up against the fact that actually people are reluctant to pay writers. Um, and so um, it closed recently. Um, because we got one lot of funding, but we didn't get enough. So we got 10,000, but really to run one four issues, to pay ourselves a thousand pounds per issue, which is you know, a fair deal, we felt, across the board, um, we would have had to make 20,000. And that's only for one year. So you're doing, you're running into this, this problem of like always having to raise cash and being dependent on funds where you actually don't want to be going after these grants, which take hours and hours to fill in. You know, I don't know anybody here. Anybody here filled in one of those grant funding applications? <laughs> you know how long it takes, and then you go. You know, we got refused. We got refused by eight people, partly because we're part of the, we were reflected the, the transition network, and they got all the funds that we could get. So that's slightly a problem. But anyway, I wouldn't put that. I wouldn't tell anybody. You know, to don't be put off. But there are realities, and one of them is distribution. And we <coughs> pay staff, we pay people to do the work. Um, and we also pay contributors too if they were poor. And they're not if they had a job. Yeah. Cool. So, <coughs> any other contributions <coughs> or people who work with other publications that have similar experiences or different experiences? I'm, I'm actually just going to ask the question um, you've all spoken about uh, newspapers. Is there anybody here who can speak about um, uh, video going <coughs> the same that form of media? Um, <coughs> got any ideas? The guy, I don't think he's here. <laughs> the guy who wants to speak, wants to speak. Oh, <coughs> I'm not sure, I'm not. Yeah, if you repeat what's in the other one, it's sure. I can say briefly, I'm, with, I'm, I'm actually from the Real News Video Office, and I wouldn't say we've got sustainable, <coughs> but 
Well, we've got a sustainable model if you're quite having been completely poor for the rest of your life. But, <laughs> but it, you know, it's sustainable in terms of, you know, enough to keep it going and to sort of eat and stuff like that. Um, and it's basically, I mean, I suppose it's a similar idea to what you're talking about. It's a, it's a subscription system, really. And, I mean, by the same token, I mean, you know that anyone can watch a DVD, but watch a film online is for nothing. But I think people subscribe because they want to support the project, a bit like you were saying, the internationalists. They actually think what we're doing is quite important. So they'll, you know, I think, I would say probably 90% of the people who subscribe to us are people who want to support the project, and they probably watch it online for nothing. And <laughs> um, which is partly why we're going out to download, so we're not like giving loads of people plastic. Bags, but I think it, it's. I think you have to think about what you're actually doing, and you know, if if to start off with, I think you've really got to learn to do this, and you've really, really got to feel socially committed to something. Once you're doing that, then your own movement should be able to fund you a little bit. So I mean, we're funding quite a lot by our own trade union project. It's not the trade union bureaucracy, by the way, because that would be too complicated they to sell out a strike, we'd have to be slapping them off, basically. But trade, rank and file trade union branches who, who are sort of agreeing with what we're doing, we, we're getting an increasing amount of money from them. And also specific things like three years ago, um, we put, we just put out a call, I, mean, I suppose this was a form of crowdfunding, really, we just put out an appeal said, three of us want to go to Greece to film the resistance or stereo over there. We need 1,500 quid, and we went to two grand in 10 days. Which took us about, that's the first time we've done that. I think that's a bit of a lesson to us that people obviously think a lot more about this than what we think about it ourselves. So we've been able to do that successfully since as well. So there's a, there's a sort of, you know, base level subscriptions which keep us going. There's also, you know, those same rank and file trade union branches that come back and go, actually, we've got a bit of cash to make it through. So you get the old paid job which keeps things going. You can, you can top it up with appeals, you can top it up with benefits. Uh, you know, like benefit gigs or whatever. And I think, but overall, I think what keeps you going is just a complete blind faith that the money's going to turn up next week. <laughs> 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 I think that's interesting. You got so much money so quickly for a specific thing as well. Because, I mean, that's all what you're saying about, well, why go on a t shirt? Yeah. If, if, you know, if you're saying, one thing, an idea we have for real media is to. <coughs> have a national fund where <coughs> England journalists or anyone can put a pitch in and say, I want to investigate this story. It's going to take me three months, this many hours a week. This is what I want to try and find out. You know, and we can, we can fund people to go away and do uh, specific investigations. And a way of possibly raising some of the funds in the first place, as well as like a monthly general giving thing, would be to, would be to say, this investigation can happen if you make it. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. I think as well, well, there's a lot of donations which are a bit like a leaky church or roof. Like, yeah, we'll get that roof finished, but you know it's going to start leaking on the other side as soon as we finish this one. And it's a never-ending thing. Whereas if you flip it and say we're going to do something positive with this, it's not a kind of constant yet another bit of sticking plaster, which just if you're in the activist space, it's hard enough to G yourself up to not be bleeding your press all the time. And if you've got this sense of we're always struggling, always struggling, Whereas if you can say we're going to do something positive, I can't say about anything else, but this good will be happening if you can get this money from these people. And it just flips the sort of, it gives people a bit of hope. Something new will happen if we do it. Have you identified any experience or what has been your experience of looking to use maybe cryptocurrency as a payment method? Um, maybe as part of a co op or something to try and kind of reward maybe the most in interesting articles, you know, maybe maybe like a subscription that distributes it according to either ratings of yeah. your articles so that you can get the best content to the top, get yeah. more interest and, and yeah. you know, more value for customers and such. I've not, I'm not aware of any cryptocurrency ones. Um, I know there was a Scottish, the Caledonian Mercury, tried to fund itself by saying readers, uh, the writers get paid according to page views. So people wrote, you know, I think Rangers are shit. And so that system didn't quite work out and they all the forward. But the, I think the, uh, the principle of a cooperative is that it's about economic reward most equitably flowing to those who generated it. And with, with the technology to track um, 
who's reading, who's distributing, who's disseminating. I'm absolutely convinced someone will come up with something which enables you to use this data to actually start to apportion rewards according to it. It's not just necessarily the writers, but if you've got people who've got networks and they're really good at seeding your content into new places, and that in itself generates new readership, then you've got the ability to say not just thank you, but that generated some economic benefit, and you should have some of that. It's only right, and it's like so many things in this space. If we just had the money to develop some halfway decent software like Airbnb, you could do something which was much more collaborative and much more communitarian rather than neoliberally exploitative. You mean like Uber for journalism? There's no reason why Uber, Facebook, Airbnb should be co op. It's just the corporate movement would rather spend its money on drugs and bankers rather than this or, or selling Lance Nazi Square badly than, than actually funding this kind of stuff. But that's another discussion for the problem. Is the work in instead of, like, say, publications and such that there should be some merit system for journalists or, you know, or cooperatives that are working on good stories, some way of you know, carrying your last bit of kudos forward rather than saying, oh, well, if, you, if you've read this, but maybe I don't know what you've done before. Yeah. So yeah. it's a shame there's not some sort of brownie point system uh, within media journalism. The same way that, like I said earlier, when I use my Twitter list, it takes ages to get onto my good journalist list. Yeah. But once you get there, that's it, you're safe because you've done X amount in my head, you know, just to, to be on that place. And yeah. I wonder if there's anything we could do in the real world that, that would make it easier to know who to trust, who to invest in, who to trust with investigating a story, who you know will see it through to completion. And then is there some way that independent journalists and bloggers and cooperatives and publication houses can form some sort of a, you know, equivalent of the, an MJ or something where you're working to support each other and, and help so that these sort of things can happen? Well, you know, that is the vision of real media. Yeah. Yeah. This is... The, you know, obviously the launch event and it's only the beginning. <coughs> that, that is what we're you know looking towards. And what would be the gains aside aside from being a mutually supportive? Is there a tick box thing for what real media will do for you and <coughs> for us? Um, well, I think the idea is to, with the demise of indie media um, and that model, is to have. Um, a system where people are involved in their particular publications, like the Crystal Cable, and they're producing those stories. But if we ag we can aggregate all of those all of those stories that are have some quality production behind them, um, but they're all in one place. So, yeah. Um, I'm having difficulty imagining, from what I understand, what the real media model might be. I'm having difficulty imagining how that can do well without taking into account the role of the cookie. Uh, cookies that track where you go in terms of the data. So I write a story about uh, corruption at the council where I, where I live. People read it and then afterwards you can go hopping along to other sites. The data I have. Uh, let's say all the people that read the story, some of them have some interests and some of them have other. Some of them might be going on to a gambling website. Some of them might be going on to a site about um, nice, healthy holidays in a nice place. I could contact the people who are organising the nice holidays and say, "You come to me, then they come to you." You know, these people come to me, and then afterwards they go to you. So, in terms of, let's say they're semi-ethical, then you can contact them and say, "We work together." But I mean, this is. It sounds like crass commercialism, but I think it's called affiliate marketing. And it's where you set up a network and everybody's talking to each other. So in the same way that someone could go to Tina Louise's website, and then afterwards go to a real media website, and then afterwards go to another website, um, by working out where the traffic is going, then there is value there. Um, and it obviously makes people nervous to talk about surveillance and things like that, and crass commercialism, but um, this is where it's at, I think. Uh, and I can't see any way. There's other ways of having the information as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, when you were just talking, what you're talking about is following completely an online model. And what a lot of what's been talked about on the panel here is actually um, what I would call a return to print model. And I don't think the two are mutually exclusive by any means. 
but I think that it's really crucial that actually um, we retain print media um, for all kinds of reasons, not least of which is personal networking and so on. And I think, I mean, what I took out of the bit of conversation about what the real media network could be was actually solving some of the problems of, like, say, transition free press. Because, um, I mean, I must confess, I do have some ambivalence about the fact that you shut down because you weren't earning money or enough money off it. Um, but I can see that there is a dilemma there. And, you know, if, if as that woman said at the front, you know, that one of the things that you kind of could have sort of brownie points or something, but individual journalists could somehow or other, you know, you could put in to say, well, actually, you know, transition between press, you know, we're a wonderful organisation, our, our journalists are really good, um, would you be prepared to put some money into us to do these, you know, it's not necessarily particular stories, but, you know, cover this range of topics. Because I think the thing that I found quite depressing about transition free press shutting down is the fact that you actually have the distribution network. And, you know, as you said, and I know, because I worked in radical media and fiction distribution for many years, um, that actually distribution is it's not sexy, people don't think about it, um, and actually, and don't take it on board thoroughly, but actually if you had that network, then for God's sake, don't let it go, you know. And you didn't have the subscribers, but that was so... Yeah, yeah, okay, but, yeah, well, I mean, I may have it wrong, but I did understand that you were actually covering everything except paying for your journalists, you know, and I think, I mean, that, that's a, a fantastic, wonderful achievement, and I think it, it should be, it would be a real pity to squander it, so I would say, like, first call for a real media <coughs> network is get transition you see what I mean? But, yeah. you know, um, and, and burnout is an issue, but you shouldn't expect all the time to get paid for your politics either. You know, so it's kind of I think I should get paid for my work, and I think my homework is going to be paid for my work. So, one hand up. Have I got, you know, I've got five or seven minutes, yeah? Oh. Um, just sort of on uh, the issue of uh, sustaining media, but there's an issue of sustaining the journalists. Um, there seems to be, if you're choosing to cover certain subjects as, as filmmakers or journalists, you are now vulnerable to being targeted, and I think this is going to build. Um, uh, Tom and myself got uh, for covering the anti-fracking movement, even though we were NUJ, they saw my car, they knew who I was. I still got a knock on the door inquiring after myself and my son from the counter-terrorism and domestic extremism unit. You've got journalists who are covering things like the I Can't Breathe protest, who got kettled by the police, 15 journalists being threatened with arrest for assault. Um, you've got the GLA who are now saying that journalists who are covering <coughs> certain actions in <coughs> Parliament Square are being threatened with arrest. It's, journalists always get pushed around, particularly lens journalists, but um, the fact that the police seem to be quite happy to be doing this in front of each other's cameras, that there's assaults, there's blocking <coughs> your cameras, there's bashing your cameras, there's threatened with arrest, there's intimidation. And um, of course, the press card has now become more important because they are now saying unless you have a press card, you can't film in certain places, and not all independent journalists have that. I, you know, it's good to be a member of the NUJ. It certainly offered me an amount of protection to sort of say to police, really, you kind of need to go back through my union. Um, but also, um, there's a reality within the union that there is this subclass of journalists. It's not just a subclass of journalists with the police, where the police are telling you that you're actually activists, they're asking where your uh, footage is going, but there is actually now, in reality, a subclass <coughs> within um, some union branches, or, well, it's definitely my union branch, where um, 
a group of us are now being described in public forums as being troublemaking journalists, police hating journalists, okay. journalists who, um, they, I'll, I'll read this out, it's public, I'll read it because I think it's really significant, um, but, uh, that there's a group of journalists who aren't interested, you know, who aren't working for professionals, who aren't interested in, make, in making money and having good quality product, that, um, uh, and that they are, youth, they are members that they, our branch want to get, some members of our branch want to get rid of, um, and that uh, these branch members who want to get rid of us are uh, not interested in attacking governments or trying to break up society. Yes, you do know who you are, and yes, this is aimed at you, um, and uh, that they are interested in improving working lives, where we're meant to be more concerned in sticking our lenses in the nose of authority. This is what, so even within the union, um, there's a subgroup um, to cover um, a lot of the stuff that we're interested in covering in this room, it won't be work for its commission. If we want to cover it in depth as opposed to swooping in for a couple of days, doing a bit of footage, deciding we know what the issue is about, and representing it in a way that Sky News would. Um, instead, you need to be there longer, you need to research, you need to do investigative journalism, you need to create a good piece of quality work. Um, so, if this is another aspect of needing to sustain media, is sustaining the people and protecting the people who are really invested in creating good quality work. Um, and it's getting to the point where you're between a rock and a hard place, not just financially, not just in where do you have your outlet for your work, but also that you're between the police and more to the point, the big companies, because it was a shale gas company who sent the police to our door, this is happening quite a lot. Um, you've got Boris Johnson, who is influenced by um, uh, big businesses, who is curtailing reporting, outside uh, the Houses of Parliament. Um, so this, this is something I think we also need to address yeah. for the future of sustaining the media we're wanting to produce. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, definitely it's a whole other workshop <coughs> on how we sustain ourselves, let alone finance our publication. A um, couple more minutes. Did, did you want did you have a hand? Uh, someone else has spoken. Okay. okay. Um, sorry, um, I'm from most of the region. Uh, so we've got quite a more extreme version of what this lady goes through. Is there are people who are considered that you mustn't talk to or report on or attach yourself to at all. And if you do, by virtue of it, you are uh, an extremist. And then if people contact you, you are now also an extremist, so they begin to edge away. So real media is not really willing to speak or, or go into this area without saying something absolutely nasty and horrible or not even trying to, even if they're disagree, not really trying to unpick the elements of it. The people who are speaking out are rapidly treating themselves as journalism and are not journalists or anything. They're the only ones willing to touch it, probably because of a family member or something like that involved in having to teach themselves very quickly and then they get touched with the back to the media. Um, and on what that situation is, it has, has occurred is that there's distrust or the actually everybody's kind of edging away from this is this person I speak to who's going to get me into trouble. Oh, oh no, look at that person, look at that person a bit uh, you distance themselves that maybe I shouldn't speak to them too. <laughs> so that that sort of thing is, is, is happening. And, so the com community is completely divided and desecrated and unable to speak even for, for each other. This then, then uh, in, uh, is where this problem always is, I don't know, <coughs> the London Symposium. <coughs> the London Symposium was investigate journalists who worked for really big media who put forward a problem that actually were in big trouble. So I was there and I put forward, and many people put forward the question, how do you actually get money for it? It was, it, was, it was the investigative journalists and the hackers 
And the hackers put forward something which nobody in this room will like, okay? <laughs> the hacker said, look, right now we've come to a juncture where we're actually, it's a make or break for our society. And we hackers have come to that conclusion and we're doing it for free, okay? And, and the reason we're doing this for free is because we're at this juncture of make and break for our society. And, and, and you journalists are so used to getting paid for it and you haven't grown up and doing it for free. Maybe you need to need to go back. And, and obviously the journalists are speaking to you the high paying journalists who are concerned, okay? They said you've got to go back to your board, board and say, how do you work as a hacker bus because we're having to sustain ourselves and, and <coughs> speak out and do all the things like this right now. <coughs> we're at this terrible juncture and we don't want our society to come in that we don't dream of. And that was really what they said. Uh, and I, 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 I think that might be the way we to So one last quote, very short one. In speaking to some people online, they actually kind of came up with some ideas is maybe we go for trying to get a, a, a percentage of, of real money by either trying to get the good capitalist or good country or good, etc., and saying, please give us 0.5% of your income for independent media and dividing it because we're at this juncture. So it might never happen, but I, I thought it was an interesting way of looking at things, and I just thought maybe some people have got an idea on that as well, because really, we need a good media, we, we've lost it, and we've had this juncture in history, which means that we don't have the ability to even discuss debate or, or, or say things anymore. Does anyone feel they need to sustain themselves before the final uh, panel? <laughs> We've got two minutes. Yeah, One more second. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say, um, I think, I think the real media idea of an aggregator doesn't need to be directly sustaining independent media financially, but to be sustaining the whole ecosystem. Of, like, I think for me, the reason I don't read more alternative media is because it, it, it currently can't form a sufficient alternative to, like, to the mainstream media, to even the Guardian, because, because it's so disparate and there's like, different bits all over the place. And I think an aggregator can help to solve that and make it easier for a lot of people to read and look at alternative media. And I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I was going to say, um, <coughs> I guess as a small part of reducing the cost of self alternative media and making it more and obviously only like, a small part is making the use <coughs> of free software and open source software and using that for you know, subscribers, for producing magazines and newspapers and open sourcing websites and, and that means that you know, the web development that goes for real media and aggregator can then be used <coughs> by other people in other countries in other like, circumstances and, and that can the investment that goes into things, those things over time forms part of a yeah, common good of the means of production of all things that need it. Cool. Thank you.